Hello traders, it's Thursday, August the 18th. This is John Kickletter, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com, here to give your FX market wrap-up for the past 24 hours of trade, as well as an outlook for what we can expect in the 24 hours ahead of us. Well, we had some noteworthy volatility, especially true of uh, risk-oriented assets, the S&P 500 included, uh, as well as the U.S. dollar. However, as has been the case consistently in our markets, it was not a opportunity to change the underlying circumstances. In other words, we got volatility, but we wouldn't actually translate that into persistence of direction. Not really finding breakouts to follow through, and certainly not finding the development of trends. We're still in congestion-laden markets, uh, whether they have clearly defined technical boundaries or not. Now, one of the big moves that we had seen this past session was actually a slip from risk trends. This actually originated uh, in Tuesday's session, and it was building more pressure uh, through the first half of Wednesday. Uh, and you can see that in the S&P 500 slip. All right, very prominent there because the technical pattern was very prominent. All right, when you have uh, circumstances of quiet, all right, quiet conditions, and I've been... Uh, showing the various ways that we can splice that inactivity. Uh, noteworthy here was the S&P 500, for example. All right, extraordinarily quiet. As a percentage of price on the S&P 500, the index that is the most uh, reserved market activity that we've seen in a very long time, comparable really only to a couple instances of extreme inactivity. So clearly, when our circumstances are such that we have such quiet, even modest moves under normal circumstances like we would see here. If I were uh, if I were evaluating the move that we had between Tuesday and Wednesday, which frankly is a very uh, modest move, I wouldn't think anything of it. I wouldn't think that there is any technical precedence there. I wouldn't say that there is a sudden change in sentiment that is uh, imminently tradable, uh, but when you are starved for action, when you are looking for any kind of uh, turnover or activity to liven what is a dead market, low volatility and very inactive markets with very low volume right, or participation, something that we uh, inherently have to expect given the uh, circumstances for the markets that we're dealing with. Remember, uh, August is very quiet. All right, participation is very low. That's exactly what we expect to deal with, and that's exactly what we're getting. But it's in these circumstances where the people that stick around that still want to trade the markets get a little bit desperate. They get a little bit uh, anxious, and they will treat very early cues of a change in tack or a change in activity, and they treat it as an opportunity, an, an imminent trade opportunity. And it's perhaps a little bit too early. I definitely think that this is way too early to call a risk aversion, although, to be fair, uh, it certainly did resolve this technical uh, wedge, I think uh, more so out of necessity than out of conviction, but we would also see that other risk-oriented assets uh, actually exhibited some pullback as well. So global equity indexes, for example, uh, the uh, DAX 30 was certainly amongst those. Here's the DAX. Or emerging market currencies, dollar peso, and dollar being the safe haven here, peso being the emerging market currency or the riskier asset. It's pretty uniform. There was a pretty uniform move towards risk aversion. All right. So it was broad. There was, uh, for some, a pretty abrupt move, which generally uh, generates that excitement that can sometimes turn into uh, momentum. But we would be still very early in an assessment of a meaningful move of risk aversion because overriding the quiet in the markets is extremely difficult to accomplish. Right? Market conditions, uh, when compared to technicals and fundamentals, are far more important. They are far more uh, comprehensive because it is a reflection of the structure. Right. So while we did have risk aversion this past session, I would not call it a cue uh, to orient towards risk aversion. And now that's very important, very important, because the there are a number of opportunities that seem to arise from it, and one of the biggest is actually dollar-yen. You can see in the SSI, people, and the retail traders are very significant net long. 
volume this past couple of days has been very heavy because people are confident that the dollar yen is going to hold at that 100 level. Why? Why is the 100 level so important? Well, technically speaking, all right, we are actually dealing with a long-term midpoint on a very prominent run. All right, so this is the record low, 75, back in 2011, and this is a 14-year high. All right, the QQE high from the Bank of Japan. Midpoint of that, 100, actually about 100 uh, plus 65 pips. So very important on a technical basis. But much of the consideration here is not technical in nature. It's actually uh, speculative uh, on a fundamental side. And that's the expectation that the Bank of Japan is monitoring this market very closely, uh, they and the Ministry of Finance, and that they are willing and ready to act if they feel that the level is going to give. All right, now, the Bank of Japan and, and the Ministry of Finance neither have said that they are watching this level in particular. The threats of intervention are there, and uh, they certainly have admitted in the past, and they rescinded that they are intervening on behalf of their exchange rate. But... Their objectives have been more about the movement, the rate of the yen's appreciation, rather than pushing through certain levels. However, as we talked about before, the markets are now kind of forcing the central bank's hands. The, the central banks have to live up to what the markets expect. If they do not, the resultant volatility and subsequently the loss of credibility for those central banks is even more painful. All right. The markets presume that 100 or parity for the dollar yen is it has to be a level that the central bank is going to work to protect. As we linger down here at 100 and we push further down, slowly, probably at first, it's going to be in, uh, uh, clearer and clearer that the central bank just isn't willing to act to hold that up. And then the fear that was perhaps uh, keeping traders from pressing dollar yen to the downside, extending that uh, very remarkable uh, bear trend that was triggered just after the introduction of negative rates, all right, it's going to probably continue. Now, I was looking at the dollar yen as a bullish opportunity before I got stopped out the other day. Uh, and my intention with that was market conditions themselves, which were we weren't going to pressure 100, we were going to uh, hold back from that level because the Bank of Japan's just uh, idle threat was going to be enough to keep market conditions in check. Market conditions being more oriented towards range and congestion, very poor for uh, making breakouts with follow through and certainly not trend. But now as we start to slip through that level, things start to change for the dollar yen. And it certainly that's why I, I just cut it. I was looking only for the short-term opportunity for holding congestion, and obviously as we started to slip down, it was not worth it. I cut out. Now, is it an opportunity to actually see it move to the downside? There is potential here, uh, but you have to evaluate when the market fully capitulates on the any hope that the Bank of Japan is going to step in and uh, offer a capable lift to the, uh, the dollar yen. Moreover, we still have to overcome the situation in which it's not easy to develop trends, bullish, bearish, or otherwise. These are not really trend-oriented markets. Even though there are a few uh, assets or currency pairs out there that have trends, it is not easy. All right, it goes against the norm. So what I need is not necessarily the Bank of Japan's credibility faltering and then you know, permanently drop below 100, I need a proactive motivator, and that proactive motivator is risk aversion. And risk aversion, as I just explained with the S&P 500, is not generating a lot of traction. There isn't a lot of reason to just think that the markets uh, have finally picked the time to delever after uh, out of their over-leveraged, uh, fundamentally uh, over-exuberant uh, view. All right, so I'm watching dollar yen very closely, but my expectations are going to be held in check. From the dollar side, all right, lots of volatility this past session based upon event risk. No trend, but lots of volatility. 
The spark for that volatility was uh, interest rate speculation. Following in the footsteps of the hawkish uh, rhetoric from Dudley and Lockhart, as well as the upgraded Atlanta Fed GDP Now forecast for the third quarter, the updates that we see, saw this past session uh, were actually hawkish. They were, uh, in normal circumstances, uh, circumstances bullish for the uh, U.S. dollar. Certainly wouldn't proved to be bullish for the dollar, however. Uh, we did have Bollard's commentary, which was certainly of the hawkish guilt, and the FOMC minutes, which came out with the hawkish uh, lean on policy views. Now, of course, when the FOMC minutes are hawkish, it doesn't really mean much to the market, because we've seen them being hawkish for quite some time, and it really hasn't engendered any traction. Uh, the Fed has consistently pushed back its time frame for a rate hike. So, uh, color me surprised that the market is not actually taking uh, their rhetoric to heart. And obviously, they've been f pushing back against the Fed's overt efforts to try to dampen skepticism that the Fed's going to hike in 2016. Uh, but it certainly was uh, worthy of some pretty significant volatility. So, some of the dollar-based crosses, once again, we, or, uh, we would have the Aussie USD with some exceptional volatility. I wouldn't expect that to be strong follow-through, although there is some uh, pretty decent range to play out there. Uh, the Euro USD. Right, not much in the way of follow through to the upside, even though we had that break above the 100-day uh, moving average uh, not too long ago. And once again, retail traders are pretty aggressively short. Uh, the most short they've been since that May peak. Something to keep in mind. Uh, and pound dollar, all right, would see a push back up to that uh, that pivot level at about 130.50, uh, but not be able to break it. So some dollar volatility, and we're probably going to get another bout of volatility, but remain skeptical of uh, the capability of trend. Uh, we will have more Fed speak, but as we've seen, skepticism in the market outweighs uh, any promises or threats made by central bankers, whether it be Fed, BOJ, UCB, wherever. Heavy, heavy skepticism. Now, the other remarkable move this past session, or lack thereof, uh, would come from the British pound. I had designs for the pound and the event risk that we had on the docket. That was the UK employment figures. That was post-Brexit, so July. It really lined up nicely to being a very important reading uh, for an economic assessment, a true economic assessment, of what the Brexit fallout would be. And obviously, the sentiment surveys have put us on a path of disaster. All right, so panic and, and uh, brimstone. But what we'd actually have from the employment figures were actually better than expected outcome. So a drop in uh, jobless claims, a, a hold in the unemployment rate, un unemployment rate at near a, uh, a decade low, 4.9%, wage growth that actually ticked up. So it was positive. Remarkable, because it goes against the fears that we had for Brexit and that epic decline that we had from the British pound. However, the pound really wouldn't be able to take any kind of uh, guidance from it, which was an unfortunate situation, because in two particular currency pairs that I had designs for on this were the pound-yen, right? and this really needed that motivation, because it had to overcome uh, the weight of risk aversion. Right? The, the lack of conviction and risk aversion and the building skepticism of the BOJ and how it's driving those yen crosses down as well. I needed uh, real motivation for the pound yen if it was going to break to the upside to really be able to carry it through. We wouldn't get it. So this is quickly turning out to be a currency pair that I am now going to avoid unless there is a very clear risk aversion sentiment that is going along a very different line. The other pound-based cross that I was very interested in was the pound key. We remember, this is a triple bottom all right, at record lows for the pound kiwi. And we went down and tested it, this momentum on the second leg of a big bear trend that we've been in for the past 12 months. Uh, it's putting pressure on that triple bottom, which has very significant historical context. We would see a move to the upside, but not a break. Now, I still think that market conditions as they are, more range-bound than they are, breakout-oriented or trend-oriented, uh, still puts the path of least resistance to the upside. 
However, we don't have the convenience of a fundamental uh, motivation to move back in that range. This becomes more dependent on the technicals and market conditions, meaning it's a little bit less likely as a probability in my book. I still think it has better chances to the upside if it does mark that move, but now I'm going to have to look for an actual progress, so maybe a break of 80-50 uh, to the upside will be my cue. But keeping an eye on it because it does have a number of the con conditions that I think are really necessary to make an overall in, uh, good setup. All right. Now as for the commodity market, I think we are still awaiting our resolution on gold, which is turning into a uh, deeper congestion pattern. A breakout will probably be necessitated relatively soon, but it's really oil that is uh, causing a lot of uh, size and uh, uh, remarkable reviews. Uh, it's continuing to run and run at a really remarkable pace given the general state of the markets. Five consecutive days to the upside through Wednesday's close. Uh, we've easily cleared through Tuesday the 50-day uh, moving average uh, that you have right here. All right, And this is all being done on speculation and, and rumor that has already uh, multiple times in the recent past proven uh, to be not really consistent. Yet the market still continues to go with it. Right, the threat that there's going to be some supply cap from OPEC uh, next month. Even though we've seen actions that would insinuate exactly the opposite, the market's still running with it. All right, how long can this last? We'll see. But this is pretty remarkable, this run itself. And it does have some spillover effect on uh, the Canadian dollar. Dollar CAD has actually followed out and been able to force a wedge break. Now, momentum is uh, of dubious uh, nature, but it certainly was capable enough of impressing that technical boundary. All right, so it does have its spillover effects. As for my trades, my dollar yen, I stopped out. Uh, my Kiwi Cat uh, has actually hit its trailed stop. All right, now, I actually didn't hit the stop itself. I hit it on the spread, but this is a very uh, illiquid pair. Uh, relatively speaking, to the uh, comparison of the euro, or USD, or dollar, or yen, um, so got knocked out on the spread. It happens. Uh, so I take the second half at uh, profit for 100 pips. The first half I got out at 144. Uh, not a bad trade, uh, especially because the second half was uh, dependent upon momentum, and really these are momentum-based markets. So I should. Uh, take the opportunity when I have it, and I did have it with the R, B, and Z reaction. So uh, certainly pleased with the overall outcome of the trade. I have taken a new position in the dollar Swiss. The dollar Swiss is actually at a very significant technical boundary, technical low. Uh, depending on where you want to draw the uh, levels of support here, uh, I do think that we have, in essence, hit that support. All right, now this does uh, respond to the volatility of the US dollar, but remember, market conditions. What kind of market conditions am I dealing with? These are quiet market conditions that are more likely to hold range than they are to uh, force breakouts and certainly into developing new trends. So I have to be very mindful of the fact that we can have volatility and there has, has been volatility in these wicks. So I put a stop that was very generous, about 125 pips below, uh, and the first target will be equivalent to that same. It makes me a little bit exposed to the time frame or the duration of the trade, uh, but I think that uh, it still has good potential. So let me keep an eye on this one. Some opportunities arising from volatility, but short term in nature, and I will be watching very closely for the next uh, conversation about uh, central banks and their credibility and their overall influence on the markets through the dollar yen and that 100 level. Uh, be very cautious and skeptical about your judgment because the markets are going to be very confused about how to call it as well. All right. We will wrap it up here. We'll do our next rundown of these markets tomorrow. Until then, I wish you good luck trading out there.